Tell Us About Yourself is sponsored by BonusRound.ca, streaming Canada's classic game shows on demand. Dive into the golden age of television with thousands of episodes of Canadian series that defined an era from anywhere in the world, all for just $1.99 a month. From iconic shows like Let's Make a Deal and Definition to cult classics like Bumper Stumpers and The Mad Dash, BonusRound.ca brings you timeless entertainment that's fun, enlightening, and affordable. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, relive the magic of Canadian television history. Subscribe now at BonusRound.ca for $1.99 and turn every night into game show night. And by The Inn at Leola Village. Nestled in the heart of picturesque Pennsylvania, the Inn at Leola Village is a sanctuary of luxury and relaxation. Indulge in the timeless beauty of their historic suites, each meticulously designed to transport you to a bygone era of elegance and grace. Experience the culinary delights of their award-winning Italian restaurant, where every dish is a masterpiece crafted from the finest local ingredients. From romantic getaways to corporate retreats, the Inn at Leola Village offers a haven for every occasion. Unwind at the spa, stroll through the lush gardens, and let the stress of everyday life melt away. Make your reservation today at theinnatleolavillage.com or call the front desk at area code 717-656-7002. The Inn at Leola Village, an oasis of luxury. Tell Us About Yourself, Conversations with Game Show Contestants is produced in partnership with the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. One of the largest history museums in the United States and one of the leading museums serving families with highly interactive exhibits and programs. Since 1968, the Strong Museum has been dedicated to exploring the ways in which play encourages learning, creativity, and discovery, and how it illuminates cultural history, and their National Archives of Game Show History. Founded by industry veterans Bob Bowden and Howard Blumenthal, the archive is home to thousands of artifacts representing over 80 years of broadcasting, including props, set designs, video interviews with game show professionals, and other iconic elements from the history of television at play. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History or the Strong National Museum of Play, visit museumofplay.org or call area code 585-263-2700. About yourself, would you? Tell us something about you. For any new viewers, won't you tell us again about yourself? We've met before, but let's meet again. Tell us about yourself. What else can you tell us about yourself? Perhaps you'd fill us in again and tell us about yourself. software at a lower price by avoiding the high research and development cost. And speaking of software, you say you have a modem but can't use all the bells and whistles because you don't have the right communication software? Listen to Paul Schindler. Communications. Did you know that using one of these devices, called modems, computers can talk on the phone, just like us, only faster. But if you already have PC communications, you might be surprised to hear that you're in a minority. Fewer than one-fourth of PCs communicate. So, many of you are waiting to make the plunge. 
Perhaps the hundreds of communications packages on the market have daunted you. Well, the Whole Earth Software Catalog and Review has sorted communications out for beginners. Now, if your computer runs the CPM operating system, we suggest you consider MIT or Modem 7. For users of the IBM PC, the best packages are SmartCom 2 and Crosstalk 16. PC Talk 3 is more limited, but then at $35, it's also the cheapest communications package. Apple computer users may want TSC Terminal if they use 40 column screens, or Data Capture 2 for 80 columns. Commodore and Radio Shack users will find CompuServe's Vidtex a best buy. Now, there simply isn't time to get into all the wonderful things you can do once you have communications, but believe me, a PC on the phone opens up new worlds. Just ask someone who already has a modem, call them, or call their computer. For random access, I'm, I'm Paul, Paul Schindler. Schindler from Orinda, California. I was a journalist for 30 years and an eighth grade U.S. history teacher for 10 years, but I'm now retired. I uh, tried out for Jeopardy in my freshman year in college, but apparently my beard and long hair scared them. Uh, and then I um, had frequent trips to L.A. from Orinda's near San Francisco. I had frequent trips to L.A. Uh, during the um, 80s, so uh, I was on the second uh, season of Jeopardy. Uh, I was on the third season of the Pat Sajak Wheel of Fortune. I uh, was on Scrabble, uh, which is the only game show I actually won. I was on the second taping of Win Ben Stein's Money, which they changed to first such because I was such a good contestant. And I was there for the very brief Merv Griffin's crosswords. I did it because I loved it. Uh, I did it because I had the personality for it. I did it because my brain is a wastebasket full of trivia. It was terrific. I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, it, it's perfect, actually. Thank you. So, Paul, one of the first questions I tend to ask my guests on this show is, what role did game shows play in your life growing up before you became a contestant? I've gotten a wide variety of answers. Uh, for me personally, it's a type of entertainment that's shaped a lot of what I want to do with my life. It's shaped a lot of my uh, you know, the way I walk, the way I talk, I mean, I, I learned a lot from game shows. I wonder, uh, again, what role that type of entertainment played for you? I was not much of a television watcher uh, during the summers. And uh, of course, during the school year, game shows at that time were uh, daytime television, except for What's My Line and I've Got a Secret, which I enjoyed, but they weren't game shows in the traditional sense. Actually, they were panel shows. One of my fondest memories of childhood is on sick days, of which I only had about a dozen in eight years, I watched Jeopardy with my mother, who watched it every day when I wasn't home. And uh, Art Fleming and Don Pardo and the little snap as those wooden cards went up and down, or the soundtrack of my aspirational childhood. I just thought that show was terrific. At the same time, I loved concentration, even though my memory, my fantastic memory, wasn't quite visual enough to do well at that game. Uh, there were a couple of other game shows that I enjoyed, and I just enjoyed them. I wanted to be a disc jockey as a boy or a television host. I used to pretend to be either uh, Steve Allen or that uh, Chicago guy. Well, anyway, I used to want to be a television host too. I didn't have the voice for it and I didn't have the talent for it. So I ended up as a professional journalist. But um, I would say the childhood effect of game shows on me was aspirational. Well, you and I are, are kindred spirit because I definitely uh, can relate to that. There was something about game shows um, something about that type of TV that just appealed to me immediately. And, it, and I think that speaks to the nature of game shows because I think that game shows by their nature are aspirational. They're meant to be watched and, uh, you know, it, it's meant to be a thing where you look at it and this is something that you can do. You could also win. You could also be here. You could also, you know, take part in this. And so I think that, uh, that, yeah, I just, I, I, I just relate to that completely. Going back to something uh, Christian, about, excuse yeah, me. Can I just tell you something that shocks people? It may or may not shock you. 
Sure. Since my appearance, uh, before my appearance on Jeopardy, I've watched it religiously. Since my appearance, I've watched it perhaps, and that was 85, I've watched it perhaps a half dozen times, and this speaks to the aspirational question. I believe one of the reasons most people watch game shows is because they can envision themselves winning. And because I lost, I no longer had that aspiration. And I enjoyed Jeopardy much less after I lost on it than I had for all those uh, decades before. Well, that does not shock me because you know what? The first game show I was ever on was The Price is Right when I was well, for my 18th birthday in 2007. And I watched that show, oh, oh it's seemingly every day. Uh, the year after I graduated high school, my father and I would watch it every single morning and we kind of compete against each other. Then I was on the show. And I watched my episode and I watched a couple after that, but it did sort of trail off after that because once you're there, it's like that vision is, is fulfilled. It's completed. Yes. Yeah. I understand that hundred percent. Uh, I, I, I want to go back quickly to something you mentioned about jeopardy and concentration. One of the subjects or one of the, the facets of game shows that's come up in a lot of the conversations that I've had recently for this podcast is the idea of sound. It's the idea of the uh, audio elements of the show uh, sticking with the viewer way past the show is off the air. And you mentioned the click of the answer cards on Jeopardy as they pull them out of that sort of low-tech board. <laughs> and you mentioned concentration as well, which also had that kind of as the as the puzzle turned around. These, you know, these elements tend to stick with a lot of people that watch those old shows. And as somebody who is a fan of technology... I wonder, so what degree did that type of low-tech yet high-tech TV capture your imagination? Well, I simply enjoyed it. I, I have to say those are the only two uh, that I distinctly remember. And obviously when I went on the new Jeopardy, the uh, whole uh, round of beeps uh, was a little unsettling. I mean, I knew it because I'd seen the show, but... I just think people are storytellers and story listeners. And I think that a game, I can't imagine a game show that made no sound at all. In particular, thinking way back, there we go. When I was a boy, I remember watching uh, reruns of uh, Groucho in the uh, primetime access hour on Channel 8 in Portland. And uh, the theme, the constant use of the theme music uh, really struck me, and I enjoyed it, and I think it set the uh, show apart. And that reminds me of there was a game show a decade or so ago where they actually brought back the live band, and I watched that one mostly because of the live band. I just thought, that's a game show tradition I enjoy. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, that's something that's definitely, I mean, it, it, it's fallen by the wayside. I think once the seventies brought about, you know, these like synthesized sort of game show themes and, you know, that kind of music. Yeah. The live band sort of fell out of favor. I think they redid, uh, the old big money show 21 back in the year 2000. They had a live band for that. That's the one I'm in. Thank you. Yeah. That's what, yeah. I, I, I really enjoyed that aspect of the show. It, it just, it feels very classy. There's a, I don't even know it's on the air anymore. It, it was for a while, but there's a show in the UK called The Thousand Heartbeats where every contestant is strapped to a heart monitor. <laughs> and if their heart, and, and they keep it, it, it's, it, it sounds ridiculous, but it really works well in practice. And uh, you have 1,000 heartbeats with which to play the game. Once your heart beats a thousand times, the game is over. So it sort of incentivizes you to calm down and they ask you sort of questions under pressure and they, you know, they want you to be out of there quickly but they have a live orchestra that plays to the tempo of your heartbeat so they will speed up and slow down as your heart rate goes up and down which i thought was really really fascinating that's Im totally impressive but then the british the obviously the center of uh, uh game show intelligence has moved from the the late goodson and todman to uh, britain where the uh, clever formats abound Yes, absolutely. Oh, I'm I'm a huge fan of of, of 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 British quiz shows. The way that they make them these days really speaks to what I look for in that in that type of game. One of the 
one of the elements of game shows that I grew up with is the digital home version, whether it's Wheel of Fortune or Jeopardy for the Nintendo, or it was uh, Concentration on my old Apple IIe, which was my very first computer. That was a part of my life that I, I cherished. I loved that type of game. As somebody who was firmly entrenched in the age of the PC as it was coming up in the late 70s, early 80s, and even beyond, was that something that was important to you as well? Did you own a lot of a lot of game show computer games? That seems to be the age for that type of for that type of, of program. I I would have been, but I um, have always um, been a books over uh, TV person as an adult. But since you ask, I have to say that because of my Jeopardy appearance, when I was at a teachers' convention, I mentioned I taught U.S. history for ten years. They introduced a specialized computer, not a piece of software, but a specialized computer that allowed you to play a very list, realistic version of Jeopardy through the television set for which you got to write the questions. And I had a video projector in my classroom. Now, the thing is, you can't get by with just three people playing. So I used two of the buzzers, and it was teams, and they passed a buzzer around, and I wrote, if I may say so, perfect Jeopardy clues, and had an enormous amount of difficulty getting the students to answer in the form of questions. But Jeopardy Day was one of the most popular days of the month, every month, when I taught, and that's thanks to specialized hardware with... Uh... Anyway, I loved using Jeopardy to teach U.S. history. You've unlocked a core childhood memory for me because I remember Jeopardy Day at my school. And it wasn't every month. It seemed like it was maybe every every couple of months or so. But I felt like that was the one day of the year where I truly got to shine <laughs> because I just enjoyed I enjoyed game shows so much. And so it, it, it felt like it was, you know, it was made for me. I was like the star for the day. And again, going back to that aspirational nature of game shows, you know, excuse me, uh, to... Christian, sure. what I'm sorry, your story reminds me of a story. And I apologize. I'm, I'm very um, tangential. When I hear things, I'm just shot off on a tangent. No, I, okay, go right ahead. I don't know if you've actually watched my episode, but I mentioned briefly uh, that I had produced and hosted a version of Jeopardy in eighth grade. That would have been 1966. And we used bells, uh, you know, like bells from a bell desk. And uh, we used a blackboard uh, for the amounts. And I had the students write the clues, which was a terrible, stupid idea because Larry Wheeler wrote half the clues. And for some reason, his team won. I didn't play. I was the host. And it was one of the most beloved experiences of my childhood was hosting and producing Jeopardy for the uh, eighth grade uh, history in um, at Beaumont High uh, Beaumont Middle Grade School in, uh, let's see, 74, 1966. Yeah. Oh, that's wonderful. In your mind, is it more fun to host or to play? <laughs> I'm sorry, I Christian. Like... I, I laugh because that is a question I have been asking yeah. myself for about 50 years. I... Sure, I, you know there are advantages to each. I think there, you know, there are different, uh, there are two different disciplines, but I feel like they both have their own unique uh, ways of being fun for the participant. Absolutely, absolutely. I. <clears throat> That's a very tough call for me. I had so much fun. Uh, being a contestant, and uh, yet I also had so much fun. The uh, well, the dozens of times in as a teacher, and the one time as a student that I hosted and produced a show. It's just an intellectual challenge that I enjoy, and that's an I interesting think, question to ask yeah. me. I'd never thought of that before. <laughs> sure, yeah, I, I've had the opportunity to do things like you've mentioned. You know, host shows for you know, for my friends and for fundraisers and things like that and kind of, you know, public speaking things. And I've had a chance to be on a few game shows as a contestant that I don't, it's very, you know, it's very hard for me as well to pick one over the other. I mean, I, you know, they're, 
they're both just insanely fun, you know, and it just being able to being able to fulfill that role that I grew up watching so many people execute, you know, flawlessly. Um, it's just always fun. It's just always fun. And it's always fun to talk about. And, you know, Christian, I, I believe that I know that I do. And I believe because of your game show experience in the era that in which you had it, that you would believe too, that it takes an outsized personality to be a good host. And in our day, it also took an outsized personality to be selected as a contestant. I will never forget being told in the Jeopardy green room, remember, you are about to go on a national primetime entertainment program, and you need to be entertaining while doing nothing more than answering questions. So be entertaining. That was the most specific reminder I received. That is very, very true. And it takes a lot of it takes a lot of different elements to come together to make a good contestant. And I, you know, I've talked to I've talked to dozens of contestants at this point, and a lot of them seem to think that it's it's it you know, it's something you're born with. It's hard to learn how to be a good game show contestant. It takes a certain it takes a, a certain type of life skill in order to be successful in that kind of thing. What, in your opinion, made you a great game show contestant? Uh, my personality. Uh, I am a cheerful, optimistic, outgoing, uh, bouncy kind of guy. At one point on um, Wheel, Pat Sajak said to me, you don't have to tell us why you're pe- pick, picking each letter, Paul. Just pick them. And uh, on Ben Stein's money, I was so rousing that uh, the Jimmy Kimmel uh, threw a pencil at me. And if I may mention, because I'm very proud of this, the contestant coordinator called me and said, well, Paul, we, we taped you for the second show, but you were so darn good that we decided to make it the first show because we figure people will stay longer if they see that kind of performance. Oh, that's wonderful. And that's by the way, wonderful. the reason Jimmy Kimmel threw a pencil at me is I kept answering the questions in the form of a question. And as you may or may not lo- know, later on the Ben Stein show, they had a dunce cap for people who did that. But oh, since I'm very I was, familiar with the dunce cap, absolutely. <laughs> I was lucky to not be a little later in my appearance there. It's interesting to me that you talk about the idea of being entertaining and how that and and correct me if I'm if I'm if I'm wrong in my understanding of your comment, but it took a stronger personality, I think, to be a contestant on those shows of the seventies, of the eighties, of the nineties. They looked for a different kind of person than they do now to, you know, these days with rare exception, it's very looks based. It's based on how many followers you have. It's based on your social media presence and not so much the, what I consider to be the sort of classical skills that a contestant of the previous eras of game shows required. I could not possibly agree with you more. I tried out for who wants to be a millionaire a dozen times and quickly discovered that they didn't give a uh, jolly gosh darn uh, about your personality. The uh, the personality part of the trial, if there was any, was so late in the process as to be trivial. And I was saddened by that. On uh, my actual Jeopardy show, I knew the answer to every clue except two of them. I, I knew all the clues and it turned out, unbeknownst to me, the buzzer made the difference. But on the half dozen times that I passed the who wants to be a millionaire telephone test, it was clear that uh, uh, they didn't care whether I was a rousing uh, player or not. In fact, again, briefly, I hope you don't mind the digression, Christian. The contestant coordinator who picked me for wheel moved on to Jeopardy. And just before the Jeopardy personality part, he walked up said hello, I recognized him, and he said, remember, I expect the same energy as last time, and somebody on his staff was on Ben Stein's money when I got on there. Uh, Appreciation of me traveled. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's always good news when uh, casting directors and casting agents uh, move from show to show and they recognize you. There's one particular uh, casting person that's put me on I think like the last two or three shows that I've done. And we just tend to follow each other. Whenever I hear this casting thing, I'll 
I'll send her an email and, you know, I say, should I bother her? Are they looking for people like me? And it's, it's very, the process has become very casual. The more shows you get out, the more casual it becomes. And sometimes they even start calling you for shows, which, you know, I tell people that it's like hard for them to believe that, you know, they could request you to be on the show. Well, it happened on Family Feud for me. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, you were mentioning that you had, was that before we started recording? I think it was. that. You, oh, it was. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse me. Yeah, no, I, I it completely blew my mind. Yeah, that uh, you were asked to be on Family Feud. Yes, I declined because I didn't care for the show. I mean, the host was fine. The show was fine. I don't know uh, America's favorite fellow, flavor of Jello, and I don't consider that to be the kind of trivia that is my specialty. Plus, getting uh, enough family and friends to go on with me would have been uh, difficult because whereas being on a game show is my life's ambition, most of the people I know uh, would not uh, do it. Uh, on a bet, my mother, who was a fantastic Jeopardy fan, when I went on, I said, Mom, you could go on Jeopardy. And she said, Paul, I do not want to go on Jeopardy and faint on television. Uh, she could not have done it. Right. <laughs> Uh, going back to something that we had mentioned previously, I think that it's important for somebody who wants to be on a game show to, as demonstrated by your family food story, go for the shows that appeal to you, whose gameplay appeals to you. Um, I, I had an audition once I was asked to appear on deal or no deal. I was asked to, you know, to go through the audition process. Right. And about a third of the way through the interview, I just completely, I just, I realized this wasn't for me. I don't like this show. I don't really like the game. There's no skill to it. <laughs> uh, you know, I, 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 I think, I think Deal or No Deal is a really unbelievably silly game and I don't know why I'm trying out for this. And so about a third of the way through the interview, I said, I think I'm going to have to end it here. I just realized I don't really have much interest in this, but good luck, you know, finding it. And, and, and they were very polite about it, but I, uh, I just couldn't bring myself to do it. You know, if, 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 if the game isn't something that speaks to you or speaks to your, your skills, or your talents, you know, I, I would, I would always try to venture elsewhere. I think that's fantastic. I was fortunate to have been able to make that decision prior to going in for the tryouts, but I do understand the spirit that motivates what you're talking about. How did you get involved with Computer Chronicles? Well, I guess I shouldn't mention her name because I've never been able to establish it. So let's just put it like this. They were casting the software reviewer and... Uh, the, it came down to uh, two of us, a, um, a very important uh, woman in software at the time, and they were looking for diversity, and I'm just another white guy, and me. And it was, in effect, reminiscent of the game show experience because we both cut auditions. What I heard later from the producer was that while she was a perfectly competent software reviewer, there was no enthusiasm and personality. You had one minute you were reviewing software, and yet you had to somehow convince the audience that you were cared and interesting and worth listening to. And that's why I got the job, and she didn't, because they, because I had those skills in part from a game show experience. You may or may not remember Christian, but oh God, all those hundreds of. Uh, software reviews I did, uh, part of the format was that there was always a piece of shtick at the beginning of every software review. If I was reviewing a uh, football uh, program, I would toss a football at the camera. And uh, there is a person, if you go on YouTube and ask for the uh, Paul Schindler Review Supercut, you will get two minutes of just my shtick without the reviews. And it reminded me of some incredibly <laughs> bizarre shtick that I did for that show. Um, but And I enjoyed it, again, because it was being on national television, which was second, my second goal, only after being a disc jockey, which I never managed. Uh, I loved the Chronicles. I was fascinated by computers. I was doing my 30 years as a computer journalist. And if you watch the shows, uh, all of which are available in the uh, Internet Archive, if you watch the shows, you will see that my 
uh, I guess they call them chirons now, we call them supers in my day, the little writing across the bottom that identifies me cycled through five different jobs during my time on the chronic. <laughs> right. Yeah, that show is looked at as a sort of time capsule of this amazing era of human history where the personal computer is coming into its own and people are realizing the potential of this medium and it it's really fascinating to watch and again i don't i, I don't I, I think this is before we recorded as well but i'll say it again to me it's a sort of prototype asmr it's 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 very relaxing and calming to hear people not arguing but discussing something discussing a, a, a very narrow topic of interest that that they clearly all have passion for it's a it's a very interesting watch i i wonder if and I don't know if you've ever had any personal insight into this, Paul, but I wonder to what degree your experience on the Chronicles helped you uh, in your pursuit of game show contested roles, um, because you were on the show, you know, from a from the early '80s on, and so Scrabble came during that time. Jeopardy, I think, came during that time. Uh, did that ever come up in your audition? Did people ever, ever, ever? Say, hey, that's that guy from that show. You know, did that ever come into play? Uh, it did not. Uh, it has certainly since. Uh, people, not as frequently as when the show was on uh, uh, public television every week, but all these years later, let's see what's it been, uh, 20 years since the show stopped taping, I do still have people come up to me and say, wait, are you that guy from the Computer Chronicles? Uh, yes, I am. And just in passing, if for any of your listeners who have anything similar to this experience, for years I was embarrassed and didn't know what to say. And my best friend from high school achieved my childhood goal of becoming a disc jockey, a spectacular number one disc jockey in the Portland and Seattle markets. And I said to him one day, Bruce, what do you do when people come up to you? He said, Paul, it's really simple. You say, thank you for watching. And then you ask them a question about themselves. And I can say with confidence, Christian, that no one who ever came up to me and said, wait, are you that guy from Ben Stein's Money? No one ever went away and said, what a jerk, because of the training I received from Bruce. And one more thing quickly, Comedy Central for several years replayed that Ben Stein's Money episode dozens of times, which was interesting for my daughters in high school because their friends would walk up to them and say, was that your dad on Ben Stein's money? The one Jimmy Kimmel threw a pencil at? Yes, it was. What an honor. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> and that is such excellent advice. You know, it, it speaks to a part of the contestant experience for me that I, uh, that, I that I had trouble with for a long time, being recognized and and, and, and having people ask questions about you know, being on the show and how did you do that? Are you, you know, oh, you must be really smart if you, you know, and, 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 and dealing with that and how to respond to all of that. It took me a long time to realize that all it takes is thank you very much. That's very nice of you. Thank you. That they're not expecting you to, you know, to sing and dance for them. And sometimes it's just a matter of being uh, gracious in a very simple way. That's a, a wonderful advice that you got. Christian, I want to ask you a question, if I may. I have I frequently been asked, to compare my hosts, and I wonder if you have been asked that question. Uh, perhaps we shouldn't share our opinions of our hosts, but are you occasionally asked by friends or relatives uh, or people whom you care to give a long answer to to compare your hosts? Uh, always. And the <laughs> one question, the one question, the overarching question that I get was, were they nice? That's all people seem to be interested in. Were they nice? And I can say that all of them were to varying degrees. Uh, you know, they were all very, I, I, I wouldn't say any of them were nasty or mean or anything, but yes, I, I get that question all the time. And in, in terms of niceness, Meredith Fiera, a millionaire is the top for me. She was oh, yeah. an absolute class act and she sent me a personal, uh, uh, a personalized handwritten card after I, I after I had appeared on the show which I, I, I keep to this day. I, I treasure that. Um, Bob Barker was very pleasant. Uh, geez, who else have I, who else have I talked to? Uh, Alec Baldwin on match game was very nice. 
he was uh, a bit of an eccentric character off camera. Um, he was he was he was he was fun to witness. It was, he's one of those people that I just never thought I'd meet in person. But but yes, I, I am asked that all the time. How were they? How are they off camera? And are they nice? Is that something that you get as well? Uh, that is something I get as well. Although in particular, you see, you were not on Jeopardy, correct, Christian? Not yet. I'm in the contestant pool. I just had my audition, so here's hoping. Oh, fantastic. Well, I was there for the Alex Trebek era, and uh, the number one question I got about Alex, unlike the others, was, um, could he, in fact, answer all the questions? And he he said this on the air several times. So I saw him say it on the air several times. No, I could not answer all the questions, although he did carry an aura about himself that he might have been able to answer all the questions. And I said he was certainly the sharpest um, host uh, that I was uh, for fortunate enough to experience. Uh, can I briefly run through? Well, I, I won't mention the one that I thought was an empty suit, but I thought Pat Sajak was very entertaining and a quick antidote about, an anecdote about Vanna White. I did make it to the final puzzle. So I was in the bye-bye shot between uh, Pat and Vanna, and I turned to Vanna and whispered, how about a little television kiss? And her response was, that great big guy in the third row, that's my boyfriend. So I did not get a television kiss. From oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's too bad. But uh, Consolation Pat, prize, isn't it? The consolation prize for not knowing salt and pepper and therefore not winning the week in Paris at the um, Hotel Saint-Jacques. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I will I will edit this part out, okay. but I can guess which of the hosts that you thought was an empty suit. And yes. if I'm correct, it's uh, a person that uh, that comment has been corroborated by several other contestants who have dealt with this particular host. <laughs> and you think it is? Uh, I think if if I could guess, it was during your time on Scrabble. Yes, I mean, you know. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Well, not I didn't say his name. I might even leave it in, but <laughs> yeah, I, I excuse me for bursting out in laughter like that. He was a extremely pleasant person, and it's the only show where I won actual money. I won three thousand dollars of uh, the the money was named after him, the fake money on the show. So I won't say it, but I won three thousand bucks, which I used, Christian to buy a tuxedo because I'm a musician in a brass band and we wear tuxedos for concerts. And that tuxedo is now coming up on 30 years old. And because I spent $3,000 on it, it looks like it did the day I bought it. But sweet, pleasant guy, uh, empty suit. <laughs> that is that so, so funny. funny. I'm so... Uh, <laughs> somehow I just knew it. I thought I... I have the list of shows you've been on. I said, out of all of them, I bet this is the one. That's so funny. <laughs> one of my uh, one of my good friends and, and, and partners in this uh, National Archives of Game Show History, he's a researcher, and they're right now going through this initial shipment of all of these props and cards and set design, all kinds of things from all those era of game shows. And he actually provided me with a, a, a perfect scan of one of those bills from Scrabble. So I'm going to email it to you once we're done here, and you can print as many as you want. Oh, thank you so much. I uh, was one of the several things I loved about that show, except, of course, um, Carousel, which is why I didn't get... Oh, wait! I, I'm sorry, again, I didn't mean to yell. Scrabble was also the only show where I came back for the second day, and those five different sports coats that I'd brought with me uh, turned out to be useful. I'm I'm very I'm very glad. Scrabble was one of my favorite shows growing up. And again, going back to something we talked about um, at the beginning, and and I'll I'll only mention this quickly, but uh, the idea of sound. There were so many sounds on Scrabble, oh, and yes. I talked to yeah, I talked to uh, a man named Eddie Tamanis, who was the first uh, blind Jeopardy 
contestant back in the late 90s, early 2000s, and he won five in a row. And he, he, he went to the tournament champions and everything. He's one of the greatest Jeopardy players. And he mentioned that Scrabble was a show that he sort of held dear because it was something that was really fun to follow along with not being able to see it. You could hear it. It was a very sonically rich sort of show. Well, this reminds me briefly, Christian, I am a, a personally a historian of radio and television. And one of the accusations against television in the early years was that it was radio with pictures. And almost all of the formats, say, for example, Groucho Marx, uh, had no basically no visual element. They were basically radio shows where you simply got to see the people talking. And game shows fall into one of two categories, the ones where you have to have the visuals to understand what's going on, and the other one where you could just listen to it on the radio. Sure. Jeopardy and Concentration. I think those are two examples of that. Yes. <laughs> it's so, so fascinating. Um, Paul, I, I am greatly appreciative uh, of this time that I've been able to talk with you about, about your experiences in the world of game shows. I wonder, in closing, how you feel uh, having had this sort of legacy as a game show contestant, when you look back on these experiences and you look back on the times that you, uh, on the on on the time you've had on on Scrabble, on Wheel, on Jeopardy, on Merv Griffin's Crosswords with Ben Stein's Money, I mean, five game shows uh, is a lot. How do you feel looking back on all those memories? I feel a great deal of pleasure. Um, my friends and family find it astounding that I was able to watch myself on um, uh, Wheel, uh, Jeopardy, and Scrabble, and Ben Stein, my, my, my first four shows. I taught 8th grade U.S. history for 10 years, and one of the ways I kept the students' attention on the last day of school every year was by playing back all of my game shows. Um, when students run into me in the grocery store now, uh, some of them graduated from college, they say to me, Mr. Schindler, I will never forget the last day of school. And people look at me and say, how could you watch yourself from 20 and 30 years ago? I say, I was entertaining then, I'm entertaining now. I always wanted to do that and this, I'd be on television, and this this in the Chronicles was as close as I got. So in essence, I enjoy it because it was the fulfillment of a childhood dream. And uh, thank you for the advice, Alex. I think I was entertaining while doing nothing more but grabbing Scrabble tiles, uh, answering questions, or uh, uh, getting joshed by uh, Jimmy Kimmel and Ben Stein. And briefly, by the way, Ben Stein was without question the most brilliant host I was ever fortunate to run into. He was a former Nixon speechwriter, and he had it all intellectually. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is hosted, produced, and edited by me, Christian Carrion, from my studio in beautiful downtown Lancaster City, Pennsylvania. Co-executive producer, Corey Anatata. Researcher, Chuck Donegan. This has been a production of Buzzerblog, the most popular game show website in the world, in partnership with the National Archives of Game Show History at the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. For more information, visit museumofplay.org. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Christian Carrion. Good night. Tell us about yourself. Conversations with Game Show Contestants is produced in partnership with the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York. One of the largest history museums in the United States and one of the leading museums serving families with highly interactive exhibits and programs. Since 1968, the Strong Museum has been dedicated to exploring the ways in which play encourages learning, creativity, and discovery and how it illuminates cultural history and their National Archives of Game Show History. Founded by industry veterans Bob Bowden and Howard Blumenthal, the archive is home to thousands of artifacts representing over 80 years of broadcasting, including props, set designs, 
video interviews with game show professionals, and other iconic elements from the history of television at play. For more information about the National Archives of Game Show History or the Strong National Museum of Play, visit museumofplay.org or call area code 585-263-2700. Tell Us About Yourself is sponsored by BonusRound.ca, streaming Canada's classic game shows on demand. Dive into the golden age of television with thousands of episodes of Canadian series that defined an era from anywhere in the world, all for just $1.99 a month. From iconic shows like Let's Make a Deal and Definition to cult classics like Bumper Stumpers and The Mad Dash, BonusRound.ca brings you timeless entertainment that's fun, enlightening, and affordable. For less than the price of a cup of coffee, relive the magic of Canadian television history. Subscribe now at bonusround.ca for $1.99 and turn every night into game show night. And by The Inn at Leola Village. Nestled in the heart of picturesque Pennsylvania, The Inn at Leola Village is a sanctuary of luxury and relaxation. Indulge in the timeless beauty of their historic suites, each meticulously designed to transport you to a bygone era of elegance and grace. Experience the culinary delights of their award-winning Italian restaurant, where every dish is a masterpiece crafted from the finest local ingredients. From romantic getaways to corporate retreats, the Inn at Leola Village offers a haven for every occasion. Unwind at the spa, stroll through the lush gardens, and let the stress of everyday life melt away. Make your reservation today at theinnatleolavillage.com or call the front desk at area code 717-656-7002. The Inn at Leola Village, an oasis of luxury.